Like everything that USA does, Mexico does almost the same, maybe a little tweaking to make it more Mexican, but it's basically the same thing. Like we're subjected to whatever the, the Americans do. And why? Because the sugar industry is, is strong there, you know, like Coca-Cola, Kellogg's and all these, uh, these big, uh, big companies. So like, like, cause there's in Mexico, there's a lot of, um, I would, it's like a love hate relationship with the United States, you know? Because uh, they blame them for all the bad things, but also are thankful because, you know, the work that uh, <laughs> they can get through there and and, st and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, so when it comes to nutrition, they say it's the Americans and all their sugary crap and things. But they don't look at their own plate and see that, you know, even though you're not eating ultra processed crab, you're still eating a lot of tortilla. You're eating a lot of bread and grains and, and legumes. But uh, I, I, there's a lot of work to do. Hello, everyone. We have our first ever return guest on a podcast, Dr. Fernando Morales. Thank you for coming, sir. Oh, thank you for inviting me, Ben. So there's a little bit of a story behind this one. I was, let me give a little bit of backstory. So when we last talked, this was like six months ago, I can't remember the episode number, but about six months ago, we chatted. And as, as we were talking about before I hit record, we were already talking about Bitcoin, Carnivore and Noster in a single episode. So there was no real time to talk about Mexico, which is the place that you're from. And I have just now started doing sort of a broader travel through Mexico than the last time we talked before I'd only been to Cancun. And right now I'm on an adventure that started in Mexico City, spent some time in Oaxaca, and now I'm living in Chiapas. So I've gotten to see a little bit more of the real Mexico. And uh, it, it really got me invigorated to get you back on and just talk about this country more, have more of a Mexico themed episode, because as you and I both sort of grazed over in the first one, this country is in very dire need of help health wise, just like the US is there. There, I don't think there's as big of a difference as a lot of people may think when, when we walk around, we see a lot of the same problems, the same health issues just over and over and over again, some even different ones over here. Um, but yeah, I, I was, I was in a Oaxaca grocery store just shopping for my meat and just had like a, a moment of like, I was just seeing so many people walking around with crap in their cart. It was like so hard to find the meat section in the store. It's like way back in this tiny little corner. I had to clean the place out just to get like a week's worth of my own meat. And I was like feeling bad because like there's there just no fatty beef there. The only beef that had fat on it, like I had to take all of it just to feed myself. And I'm like, this is terrible. You know, pe no one is getting this. Like there's a huge chicken section. and There's always cerdo and pollo everywhere, but I got to find the rice. It's it's always snuck in the back. It's harder to find. So, yeah, I, I just had a moment in that store. I was like, I need to get this guy back on. Like, I need to get my boy, Dr. Morales, in here who can actually give some more elaboration on this problem because I think it's so important that we all come together with both of our communities. You have a Spanish-speaking Mexican community on your YouTube channel. Uh, we both have some decent reach on Noster. And I just think that uh, since so many people in this space are from the U.S., we're so close to Mexico and I feel like we, uh, us Americans, we need to like understand our neighbors a little bit better, you know, because as I've done my travels, I've realized I really didn't know much at all about Mexico. And so it's, it's a really cool place to go. Beautiful place. And yeah, why don't we just start out? <laughs> that's a little bit of a long rant, start things out here, but um, why don't we give just a quick review? Obviously I recommend people go back listen to our first episode before this one if they can but could you just give us a quick sort of overview of who you are so we can get this thing rolling so i'm dr fernando morales i'm a general practitioner uh and I have a private practice in northern mexico and chihuahua so basically i've been implementing the carver diet with my patients since uh, last year actually and been having the same awesome results that basically anyone who <laughs> follows a carnivore diet gets so that, that's basically my my story it's been very successful uh, it's been successful. I've been successful treating patients with chronic diseases and I opened, I, I started my YouTube channel also at the end of last year, mainly to help myself out, uh, with my patients, because I would have like an hour and a half, two hour long consultations, just bombarding them with a lot of, uh, information they'd never heard before. So it was easier for me just to have a lot of videos on YouTube. So, okay, if you forget what we talked about here, just look up the video on, on YouTube and then start growing. And uh, just a little quick fact, like, yeah, a third of my, of my viewers are from Mexico. Another third are like around from, from the United States. And another third are from Spain. So that's, that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, but after, uh, after, after, uh, after hearing what you said about uh, southern Mexico, well, you're in Oaxaca, right? So you said there was no beef. 
the problem it was hard there, to find you know yeah. i was in the in practically the middle of the city i mean maybe not hard, hard is maybe a strong word like you can find it around there, there are places you can get it but at the at the big main grocery stores those are where i usually go so mm-hmm. i kind of use that as my barometer and, and compare that to other ones i've been to um places basically wherever there's a shed rally you're going to be good there's going to be quite a bit that's like a big grocery store here but in oaxaca there wasn't any of those in walking distance it so uh, i can't remember the name of it but it was a pretty big grocery store it was like a sort of fred meyer walmart kind of equivalent i guess um and yeah it's just there was like no meat there it's the the problem there is that it's southern mexico so like mexico is a pretty big country and we like to divide it usually in north, center, and south. The south being the poorest part of, of, of the country. So in the south, actually, beef is expensive and hard to find, Like just like you mentioned. It's mainly pork and chicken, what they eat there. Obviously, maize, which is corn. So that's the reason. But if you come to the north, for example, you have beef everywhere. It, it is part of the culture. It's part of the identity of the northerners, las, las carnes asadas, you know. Every, it's very common here for every weekend, family to get together, family and friends, and just just be grilling meat on, on the grill on the grill. So it depends where you are in Mexico. So yeah, you I've never been to Oaxaca, but what you just explained to me sounds exactly what I've I've known for a long time. I've been to Yucatan and Quintana Roo, part of southern Mexico, and yes, same thing there. It's uh, mainly Mayan, you know, Mayan type culture. It's pork and it's chicken. What they eat as from their protein, of course, plenty of seafood. I'm guessing you can find plenty of seafood in Oaxaca too, as well, or not really. I, I haven't really looked for it, but I'm sure you can. Yeah, I, I never really zero in on the seafood, so I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, exactly. Exa- I know in Cancun, since it's a very international place, you do get easy access to beef. It's, it's a lot more expensive than it is in the north, obviously, but it's definitely easy to find. But uh, do you have any certain? Before I get into like the the, the stats, you know, because Mexico has big health problems do you have any questions or, or doubts about your trip down there definitely no doubts i'm having an amazing time um it's just been so cool to see these more real like mexico places because cancun isn't like you know the mexico is of mexico <laughs> like yeah, you said. exactly so yeah. getting a lot deeper view even just today as I, as I mentioned you earlier we i'm in san cristobal now if i didn't mention and we just went on a very long walk up into the mountains and there are some beautiful hiking trails. We went hiking and there's just caves that you can walk through. And everywhere you go here, there is just, uh, well, not everywhere you go, but there's certain places like in the forest that are like places that used to be these ancient outposts for the Mayans. Yeah. And so you can see certain rocks are just shaped and it's sort of a scavenger hunt to try to figure out which things are man-made, which things aren't, which is a really cool uh just it opens your brain to walk around these places because you could just think about how much history is here you know and the contrast when you go from you know they're just walking through town for me to get back home and seeing all these people who are struggling badly just um working their asses off at these selling these little trinkets and and shops and there's street food everywhere and there's you know I, i don't know what you call that kind of economy but there's just so much entrepreneurship but it's informal, it's, informal economy. Yeah, it's huge yeah. in Mexico. Sixty percent mm-hmm. of uh, employee population is informal. You know. Yeah, yeah, and I saw that everywhere I've been on this trip, far more than Cancun. So Mexico City, there are tons of that everywhere you walk. And Mexico City is another one where you see that contrast of the pre-fiat to post-fiat life. You know, because you see these massive, epic buildings that were built all over the place, and three blocks from there it just looks like slums you know it's just major contrast and i remember i was literally taking a picture of one of these uh really cool cathedrals in this town square and there's like a homeless guy like in in the fountain like taking a bath you know and it's just everywhere you go you see this huge contrast of like what what used to be and what is happening now and i don't think i've ever seen a place with this much contrast before I, i know a lot of people talk about places like Argentina as an example where there's like really cool architecture and, you know, the inflation is really bad. So there's a contrast. But for me, in my travels, I've never seen it as much as I have on this trip, um, both on, you know, the semi recent scale of those that cool architecture and the super ancient scale of seeing uh, these caves built by mm-hmm. the Mayans out in the jungle, which yeah. are just enormous in scale. And it's, it's really hard to explain it. I'll uh, I've, I still need to go through my pictures I've taken because I don't even know if they're, it's going to show up how freaking cool that this pla- these places are. But you can see like old 
formations that were built who knows how many thousands of years ago. So it's just really mind expanding. And uh, yeah, it, Mexico is just a crazy place. And I really recommend more people check it out. But um, I, <laughs> I don't I don't know where I was going with that particularly. But did, did you have another thing you're going to add in there? Or should we uh, get rolling yeah. here for? Yeah, no, no, real quick. Like, yes, so you know, like the the uh, the background, the, um, uh, the dishes, the food around Mexico. For example, the Mayans, uh, which were in the southeastern part of Mexico, uh, they, according to their history, through the ancient lore, like there were four, three humans type, three types of humans before them, before the Mayans. I forgot what each ones were made of. I know the second ones were made of twigs, and therefore they were imperfect. But the Mayans, the fourth try of the gods to make humans was perfect because they were made out of the, the, the blood of the gods and corn. So yeah, exactly. So that kind of tells you how sacred grains in this case, corn is to, to the Mayans. So like us eating grains is basically like, it's part of the culture in Southern and central deep. Mexico. I did yes. not know that. That's crazy. So like talk about having deeply ingrained, just like poison. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's in your culture. So like when you talk to people about, uh, going carnivore, I guess, especially in the South or center part, central part, like it's a, it's like a battle against their identity. Like they identify as Mexico. I don't know if you knew, but in 2010, the UNESCO, UNESCO, um, I forgot. I, that's not how you say it in Spanish. It's one of those UN. Uh, departments they declared the me mexican cuisine as a world heritage like, they ele elevated to world heritage status so like a lot of mexicans got proud because of that you know because the mixture between the spaniards and the natives here created this culinary what others consider masterpiece i consider kind of a um perhaps uh, a downfall in not so much <laughs> in health, exactly because uh, not, not masterpiece that's not the know, word we would use perhaps not a masterpiece <laughs> for health maybe for your taste buds yeah could be um, visually presentation wise and just like entertainment value uh yeah. not so much health <laughs> exactly exactly and in northern mexico uh, okay, so the grains we usually we use here actually is uh, flour tortillas, but we actually, we also eat a lot more meat, and that's yeah, that was even present in pre pre Hispanic times, and it's a desert plains, so the natives here would hunt buffalo and deer during the winter. Yeah, they would have plants like yuca and some corn perhaps, um, but may, may, a lot of what they did was eat meat and move around a lot. So even since before the Spaniards came, it was already kind of a meat. Uh, it was the meat center of the <laughs> of Mesoamerica, and in, in, short, in, in a few words, the Spaniards came, and a lot of Mexican cuisine originated in Puebla, uh, the city of Puebla, which is in the state of Puebla, and it was because of nuns. Nuns were uh, experimenting and combining different types of food, so a lot of Mexican cuisine comes from that part of of Mexico. And I was also researching. Sorry to interrupt. Recently, that I don't know if you watched that show on Netflix, Ancient Apocalypse, with Graham Hancock, but one of the places that he highlights as one of the oldest place in Mesopotamia and really the roots of a lot of history here is this huge pyramid in Puebla. There's like this big hill with a church on top where, <clears> which is actually like a really, Cholula. really, really old pyramid. Yeah. I forget the name of it, but yes, in Cholula. Um, yeah. Paolo, uh, do you remember the name of that, uh, that site at the, in Puebla, the really ancient one? Cholula. Cholula. Did you, is that what you just said? Cholula, yeah. Cholula, yeah, okay. Cholula. <laughs> yeah, we were watching it together. We were both watching the show. I forgot the name of it. But um, yeah, so th that's probably another reason why this is really the epicenter of a lot of the culture that's expanded out. Exactly. So, it, it, no, there's a lot of like hidden cities and let's say even civilizations perhaps in the jungles of uh, Mesoamerica down there in, in southern and even central Mexico. They're still discovering things every single day. But uh, it's quite interesting. Anyways, uh so that, that that's like that's, that's so people can understand that even from pre-Hispanic times, it's very common for plants to be in our diet. Obviously, since when the megafauna died out, you know, after the our our ancient ancestors crossed the uh, the uh, Bering Ber no, it's Bering Strait. Yeah, Bering Strait. I forgot the name. Uh, I'm so this. bad at remembering names of places. Like yeah, <laughs> it's dates the, and the places. Bridge. I'm bad at. <laughs> yeah, for, so, so the name uh, the name the name slipped my 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 tongue. Anyways. Um, you know, as the megafauna st started dying out, people looked at agriculture. Luckily, in northern Mexico and south, like the plains of the United States, we still have buffalo and, you know, all these big fatty animals available. So those people still managed to eat a substantial amount of meat. Anyways, so 
fast forwarding to towards today, there's a, a, a pretty big survey that's done in Mexico. At Esanut is the name of the survey that they do. It's, so there's like they, they interview uh, tens of thousands of Mexicans in different parts of the, the country to get more or less a view on how the how we're doing metabolically, like healthy and diet wise and whatnot. So the the most recent one was released in 2023 because uh, the study the re, the survey was from 2020 to 2023 and it turned out that in adults like sh people from tw who are 20 years or older of age 74% of them are either overweight or obese and then and it's basically the same like uh, like 30 32 30 37% are are obese 30 Seven percent are overweight, so that is a huge part of the adult population. It doesn't get better for the child population. Like they also did the survey for children from five 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 years of age to nineteen, and it's even worse. It's uh, around seventy seven percent of the population was either overweight or obese, and um, actually, and there's a, there's a lot of information they also include in this in this survey. Like in two thousand sixteen. 23% uh, of the total energy that they measure in calories of the energy intake of the average Mexican was uh, was from ultra processed foods and mainly in the form of uh, sugary drinks like sodas. That's and exactly I don't know what if, I've been seeing here. That's yeah. exactly in line with it. That's all yeah. they drink. And, and I don't know if you noticed, but uh, in Mexico, you can find three liter Coca-Cola bottles. Like in the United States and Europe, that's I think two liters is the largest you, you can find. I know in Latin America, but especially in Mexico, they, they created these even larger ones because of how much we love sugary, <laughs> sugary drinks. So that, that's a huge problem. That's the num number one thing. The, uh, the other important thing that this uh, survey pointed out was that obesity and all the consequences that follow obesity uh, apparently cost Mexico, well, it's like at 6% of its GDP is uh, required to maintain uh, and sustain all these obese people and all of their diseases that come along with it. So it's a huge amount. Like the Mexican military is just 0.5 to 1% of its GDP. So like that's a huge amount of uh, of uh, upkeep people. The government has to try to like, they try to pour money into the, uh, the public sector to uh, sustain all these people because the medications that diabetic people are on, hypertensive people are on, it's, it's expensive. And they're not just on one medication. They're usually on two, three, four, like a lot of different types of stuff. And then the interventions, dialysis, once your kidneys give out, you know, uh, diabetes is the number one cause of renal failure in the world. So that's a huge problem as well. And uh, the private sector has kind of stepped up there because 50% of all the primary care that uh, Mexicans receive in Mexico are from the private sector. And now you would think, oh, fancy private sector. No, no. Like uh, when I mentioned private sector in Mexico, I'm talking, and I'm sure you've seen it, in almost every pharmacy, there's a, a medical office attached to it. I don't know if you noticed. I haven't even gone to a pharmacy since I've been here. Oh, oh, a good. carnivore diet, baby. Oh, I don't need oh, no meds. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't had Moctezuma's revenge yet. Okay. Nothing. No. Fantastic. No. Um, so, it's these very cheap uh, consultations. Like on average, they charge 25 pesos per consultation. So that's about a dollar and a half, like a dollar and 50 cents more or less per consultation. So the average Mexican, yeah, a lot of them have access to public health care, more or less, but it's so degraded, so slow, so inefficient. They prefer to go to the, the private sector for their primary care. And uh, unfortunately, since these uh, private practices are attached to a pharmacy, like they're employed by the pharmacy, guess what the pharmacy's business model is, right? It's to sell medicine. So a lot of these uh, in these uh, private in these private practices they don't have to walk far to get those drugs. Exactly. So they just, uh, you know, it's I've had friends working there, and they they would uh, tell me that the boss would go to them and like, okay, we have a ex um, excessive amount of such and such medication. Please give it out, even if the patient doesn't really need it. So oh, God. that's that's private sector. Not exactly, you know, the incentives so are wrong. Yeah, the and the incentives are wrong. Basically, again, I would blame fiat for that, but <laughs> get into that that later. And actually, ob obesity is such a problem in Mexico that it was declared um, epidemiological emergency by the Secretary of Health in 2016 as well. Uh, things that Mexico has tried to do to reduce um, ultra-processed food intake is increase the taxes on them, 
like all the potato chips and these uh, sweet breads you see in the oxos and whatnot, the increased taxes there, they start adding these labels a few years ago or excess calories, excess sugar, but um, it also goes for excess fats. Like you can get a, a delicious beef yeah, jerky. Yeah, excess salt and excess, excess fat salt, too. Exactly. You know, they just kind of... It's mixed in with so much BS that it's yeah. not really helping. <laughs> exactly. Know? So it's not really helpful at all. They've tried doing that because uh, Mexican obesity has gone up around, I believe, 58% in the last 23, 24 years. So it, it was it, from the year 2000 onwards to 2012, it was like a huge rise. Then more or less stabilized. So it's steadily growing. So, uh, but stabilized it, at a bad place. <laughs> yeah, stabilized. Yeah, exactly, stabilized at a bad place. Slowly growing, but stabilized in, <laughs> in, uh, in a bad place. So, some people. It, uh, that's, it, real quick, I'll just throw yeah. in like th this is very in line with what I would would have expected because uh, I'm not sure if you've compared the like morbid obesity of U.S. versus Mexico, but from my uh, my spectating, my what I've seen. I th it seems like Mexico has almost as much or higher percentage of people that are like fairly unhealthy, but there just aren't as many people that are extremely unhealthy. Like in in the USA, the, the, the classic joke is you walk through a Walmart and you see people who are literally like, you know, 500, 600, 700 pounds in wheelchairs. Yeah. You don't really see any of that in Mexico. It's like, I'm not sure exactly why. Um, maybe it's like a respect thing or people just have like a lower bar where they really decide like, okay, I need to change something. Um, because of culture i'm not really sure like do you have any guesses for why that would be like why there isn't as much of an amplitude of bad outcomes as there are in the u.s now i i, I don't i don't know exactly the stats behind that and uh it's just a wild guess but i would guess it's more about money and purchasing power more than anything else like in the united states you can just afford to buy more crap. true and here there, it's there's like, like an infinite runway to just keep getting further yeah. into your addiction where there's like a cap here because their money isn't strong that's a great exactly. point i think that's probably it it could be that, and obviously, as a you know, as a poor nation, uh, the informal economy involves a lot of getting up and selling things on the street and being perhaps a bit more active. So maybe yeah. that, that helps. People are busting their butt out here, like every, especially yeah. in Mexico City. Like when you walk around, it's just packed with these these uh, the the informal shops, like you mentioned. They're and hardworking people. That takes yeah. a lot of work. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and when you're busy working, you're probably not snacking as much as frequent. So I guess that could also play. But these are just well, well, the guesses, to be honest. And um, so, like, where was another important thing? Okay, so in this in this uh, survey, now, okay, so so this is what the information I just spit at you is what the, we reported. The funny part is uh, what they consider the problem. They say that the main problem is energy drinks, because actually Mexico is one of the highest, is a country with the highest consumption of energy drinks, obviously ultra processed foods. And, uh, and then they, they put their solutions like this is what Mexico can do to increase the thing. Number one, it's to follow uh, the UN's guidelines for uh, reducing obesity. Well, I haven't looked into that. <sighs> But I can only imagine it's going to be it's, trash. Yeah, it's going to be trash. Exactly. It's, it's going to be, be the, the mixed diet, the food pyramid, probably yeah, similar. Exactly. And I'll get to that later. Uh, so I wrote them down because there are a few solutions. So the solutions proposed are obviously higher taxes on all per, ultra processed food and drinks. That didn't go so well, but it will. Uh, they uh, want to regulate the publicity towards children. I don't know. I guess you didn't don't know this, obviously. More but, government uh, power. Every every one of these is more government power, more taxes, more regulation. Yeah, yeah. basically. That's Sounds a solution. Right. More, more government is, is, the, is the solution. Uh, but like before, a few years ago, I would say like 10 years ago or more, um, a lot of the junk food used to have characters. You know, like, I know, you know how this um, tiger from... Frosted Tony Flakes, the Tiger, man. Frosted and, Flakes, I think. I'm still yeah. indoctrinated by that. I, I yeah, wish yeah, I didn't too. have brain space remembering these things. But yeah. they I'll push you so hard on Nickelodeon and all those other kids' channels. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So like almost every junk food had a character. So Mexico, Mexico banned that uh, some years ago. So now it's just the name of the product, but there's no more characters to like incite children to have it. But like, come on. Uh, they're going to want the, the, the sugar, the addiction. I don't think that helped a lot. Anyways, another solution proposed is the protecting protecting what is breastfeeding, like pr um, promoting it more and more. That's a good thing. I, I totally agree with that one. Um, I, I've seen that happening fairly often publicly around here, and I think it's awesome. That, yeah. That's just like normalized for sure. 
yeah, I think we should acknowledge the good things, like obviously, not, not just uh, point out the bad. And uh, avoid the interference of the obviously sugar industry and the public health sector, because, you know, I know the United States, I think Coca-Cola puts in nine times more money into uh, nutritional research than the NIH. So yeah, I'm yeah. guessing something happens, happens like that in Mexico. And uh, increase the availability of healthy foods. So I read that and I'm like, hmm, okay, what do they consider healthy foods? Because that's exactly. kind of <laughs> abstract. So they were always referencing something, uh, the guidelines, the Mexican guidelines, like follow the Mexican guidelines to know what healthy food is. So I, I took a look into that and I don't know if I can share a screen real quick. Yeah, let's try it. You see the little share button down there? Yeah, here it is. So I'll do some quick translating. You can see all this, right? Yes, I do now. Go okay, for it. I'm going to quickly go down. So like, this is, these are the guidelines for, uh, the, for Mexicans, like how to eat and to achieve health. And uh, we're going down, and we can see right away. First of all, they start talking about uh, climate change, right? Oh, okay, God. Sure. <laughs> Why not? And then <laughs> here's an important one. Like, what? Uh, what type of foods are not good for the environment? And then right away, oh beef. no, carne de res. Number one, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because it needs too much ground and water to produce. It also what ha generates the most greenhouse gases, and it basically goes with any type of meat, like uh, it's a beef and all other processed uh, foods and, and dairy. And then it says, what's the good thing? Well, fruits, vegetables, legumes, and uh, cereals and stuff. So like, okay. Now I see where this is going. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about this later because uh, no, I'll talk about it right now. The solution is to tax what they deem to be bad food. So I can only imagine that that includes beef, you know, and, and, and other types of meat. It's number one on top of the chart. You know, it's in the crosshairs. <laughs> it's right there. Exactly. So they start giving a lot of stats about uh, obesity problems and things. But I, wa I want to get quickly to the, uh, the chart there. Uh, we call it el plato del buen comer, like the good eating plate, or I don't know exactly how to translate that. Let me get to it real quick. I am it's, not seeing any meat on any of these pictures of people being happy and healthy. Happy. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of people holding cucumbers and salads. And things like that, exactly. So I'm trying, here we go. So this is the recommended plate oh, for no. the average Mexican. So you can oh, see 50% is fruits and vegetables. And now it's like, eh, I guess you can somewhat... 25%-ish for grains and cereals, legumes, somewhat similar. And then you can see a tiny little origen animal, like, or, uh, or uh, from, uh, that originate from animal, a little red right there. The meat, it's like almost nothing. And then they combine it, the size is more or less similar of that of uh, fats, uh, healthy fats and oils. But, you know, they put uh, avocado oil and plant oils. Other, other vegetables. Plants. Yeah, exactly. So Wild. this is what's recommended. Like, if you eat this, Okay, will you be healthier than if you eat ultra-processed food, a standard American diet or standard Mexican diet? Yeah, I think you will be better off. But long-term, like this is going to cause problems. And it met all the oxalates you're also consuming here, like that's going to be a huge problem as well. And I think oxalates are a hidden problem that no one talks about. Because Mexico starts to talk about, um, I've seen other doctors talk about insulin resistance, finally, after who knows how long. But they don't talk about all the other things that are present in plants, you know, like as Dr. Anthony Chafee likes to say a lot, plants are trying to kill you, you know. <laughs> so there's a lot of other things other than just sugars that are uh, intoxicating you and, 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 and damaging you. Because uh, another thing that they blamed in this um, survey is the genetics, you know, like the classic. You got to you know, throw that in there. Yeah, It's genetics. That's you their know? favorite like, thing ever to just use as a cop out. Exactly. So they point out the problem, which is, I mean, one of the pro big problems, yeah, it's ultra processed food, but where they always get it wrong is in the solutions or identifying, uh, they misdirect the, uh, the enemy you know, or towards the wrong thing. In this case, meat as well as supposedly one of the unhealthy things. And, and speaking that, of misdirection on that chart under the meat, saying that meat is the worst for the environment, it does have, I think, ultra processed food in there. So it mixes in just yeah. a little bit of truth to to make it look legitimate uh just enough to you know get people following along their story that they're they're guiding you down it, which is just essentially the exact same thing as the usda food pyramid that is yeah. completely ruined everything i actually have a video about that on my youtube channel where i talked like everything that usa does Mexico does almost the same, maybe a little tweaking to make it more Mexican, but it's basically the same thing. Like we're subjected to whatever the, the Americans do. And 
Why? Because the sugar industry is is strong there. You know, like Coca Cola, Kellogg's, and all these uh, these big uh, big companies. So like like because there's in Mexico there's a lot of um, I would it's like a love hate relationship with the United States. You know. Because uh, they blame them for all the bad things, but also are thankful because, you know, the work that uh, <laughs> they can get through there and and, st and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, so when it comes to nutrition, they say it's the Americans and all their sugary crap and things. But they don't look at their own plate and see that, you know, even though you're not eating ultra processed crap, you're still eating a lot of tortilla. You're eating a lot of bread and grains and, and legumes. But uh, I, I honestly don't know how this is going to play out long term for Mexico, because the goal of in this in the survey, the goal is that by 2030, they want to flatline. Well, that's, that's their goal. They just want, they're no longer really interested in like lowering the obesity rate. It's just like making the, uh, the growth a lot slower. Like that, that is their objective right now, like lowballing it like terribly. And uh, Jesus, I, I, there's a lot of work to do. And that's why I'm really happy you're doing these type of podcasts. It's getting the word out there for uh, other people. Like, also, people in the United States right now who are from Latin America, who a lot of times they have a lot of family members in this part of the world still. And uh, they can share this type of content with them and hopefully create conscious. And it's, 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 it's happening. My, my YouTube channel is slowly growing. And uh, I'm discovering other people uh, who... Already know about this. Already know about this. And, and I'm, I was going to ask about that because yeah. last time we talked, you said there was like nobody that you could find in Mexico that was doing this. Have you found more people that are helping spread the same message? Yeah, I, I found a, a fitness coach, a health nutrition and nutrition coach in San Luis Potosi, central central Mexico. She's been implementing carnivore diet for some some good, good time right now. In the city, I've heard about okay, so carnivore carnivore. I have not heard of a uh, doctor or nutriologist implementing it. I've heard of like keto type with, with the emphasis on, 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 on meat, red fatty meat. So that's, that's already a good start. I'm, I'm even I'll here. In we'll take it even, as a step in the right direction. <laughs> exactly. Even here in Chihuahua, but uh carnivore carnivore per se, I haven't seen that yet. And uh, I'm hoping that it will keep on growing. I'm hoping that uh, people will just step up and have courage to do so because uh, I already started getting my first haters on, on, uh, on the channel. Oh, it's a good sign. Yeah, that's a good sign. I'm guessing a lot of uh, doctors don't want to face all the, the, the uh, what, do you, what do you call it? The flash? No, the backlash, backlash yeah. of stepping out of Or, or out the of realization that everything they were taught in med school, medical school is a total lie. You know, there's so many different things that people are emotionally attached to. It's either, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to realize that I waste all this time and money. I don't want to realize that I've been, you know, giving all my patients this terrible advice that is making them all more sick and just keeping them sick. And they just don't want to really face the music in the sense that they are part of a system that's making things worse. They want, they, they join this industry to feel like they're helping. So they really want to feel like they're helping and anything that even like gives them the, the idea that maybe they were making things worse is just, it breaks their brain and they just react negatively. Like, no, get away from me. I don't want to hear it. And that's where I respect Dr. Ken Berry, for example. Like he, he admits he did that a lot, for a long time during his career. And for him to admit that he did wrong and trying to make up for it, like that, that's uh, my, my respects to Dr. Ken Berry for that. Absolutely. Luckily for me, I discovered these great doctors in my early on in my career. So yeah, I did, I did for like, a, uh, for some time, give that same advice to people, but luckily I have plenty of time to, to, to make up for it. And, uh, I want to invite, I think we should focus a lot on the younger doctors too. I mean, if yeah. older ones, sure, of course, but, uh, there's a, th this internet, the internet is a beautiful tool. And obviously the big, the internet natives like Gen Z and obviously old millennials, I think there's a, we, we, we can get this far and wide if we try try hard enough and uh real quick just let last stats i don't want to bore the uh, audience too much in mexico i don't know how it's the united states but one out of every five six mexicans has diabetes adults and in the adult population that is terrible and uh 90 percent of people between the age ranges of 40 and 60 are either overweight or obese so it's almost guaranteed that you're above 40 you're most likely an overweight or an, an obese person and like these people are still in time to, to, to like, I've, you've heard many times Dr. Shafi, right? That, uh, in theory, genetically speaking, humans can live up to 120, 150 years old. Yep. 
Like you develop diabetes and get obesity in your forties. Like you're looking at problems the next 20, 30 years that could end your life. Like, and you're basically dying at half of your, your, your total lifespan. That is terrible. And you can get a lot of your life, maybe not lifespan back, but definitely your quality of life. And that's what I've, I've been seeing in my patients. Um, their quality of life just improves. Like they don't care if they live longer or not. They just care about feeling better. So like recently I had this uh, patient who arrived to my uh, private practice with glucose of about 500 milligrams per deciliter. I know, I think the United States use a different uh, measure, but that's pretty damn high. that high. <laughs> I, yeah, so like pretty damn high, huge. And then in less than a month with, oh, she was with insulin and a crap load of different other medications. And her doctor just didn't, she told me like her doctor didn't know what to do with her. And then when she mentioned to her doctor in the public sector that she's going to go look for help with, well, in this case, me, because she heard of me through another patient. Uh, she said her doctor was like with, with relief, like, oh, God, thank you. Thank God. I can no longer my problem. It's kind of sad, really. But uh, in less than a month, we got her off insulin and only on one medication, metformin. Her glucose levels dropped from an average of like 400, I guess, uh, day on day. Uh, she's waking up with glucose around 100, more or less, fasting glucose. That is amazing. Like she managed to turn things around right away. And it's obviously the discipline. I tell my patients, like, I can only offer you information, but you are the ones who implement this. You're the ones who have to be disciplined about it and, and see the results. So I think that's important to mention why. And for if doctors are hearing this to listen, why? Because a common um, point of view in many doctors is that patients aren't going to follow uh, lifestyle recommendations. And I've heard it many times amongst my colleagues, like, I don't even recommend it. They're not going to pay attention. So I'm just going to give them the, the, the medication. And I think that's, that is wrong. Like, if, if, if you see a patient that is truly interested, oh, they will go far and wide to, to feel better. Because who doesn't want to feel great? Who doesn't want to uh, stop injecting insulin all the time? So, like, I, I invite doctors to just uh, have a bit more patience, a bit more of an open heart. Uh, uh, I know that it's hard if you're working in these pharmacies, if you're working in the public sector. That's why uh, I, I don't. I think Bitcoin will help solve this because if you're better off financially, you're more you're more likely to do your own private practice, have control. I think I can only do what I'm doing right now because I have control of my own practice. So and I think, think for, long term too. Just exactly, like the mental side is huge. Exactly. So uh, I think that's important to take in consideration. Your patient is not someone. Who, it's just not some drone all the time. Not, not everyone's the same. A lot of people actually want to change, want to get better. Sure, plenty of people will continue being fat. You will give them the holy grail of information to turn around their health and they will stick to what they're doing again because it's also ingrained in their culture. But uh, uh, that goes back to the, what we were commenting in the first episode that it's usually the sickest people who go on on this journey. And uh, yeah, I, I, I digressed a bit there. Sorry. So I... I uh, I don't that's know great. We left I'm, off. <laughs> I'm so in agreement. I think that that's an important thing to talk about because another thing we were talking about before we started is just how the main goal that we should all have as people who are putting this message out is to try to expand and lower the average age. First of all, that's like a simple metric. I was talking about how over 90% of my YouTube audience is over the age of 40, which I thought was wild. You know, I, I didn't expect that before I looked, but I then put out some polls on uh, Twitter to ask like other carnivore channels like Dave Mack. I remember he responded. Yeah, like most people are like 40s and 50s. And if you scroll through his his video channel, the thumbnails, you can see all the faces there and get a pretty good idea. These are all people that have stories. They're pretty much all 40s, 50s, 60s. And we need to really focus on lowering that age range. Not, not that we don't love all those people. and We're super happy for them, of course, but... Uh, how cool would it be to not have to go through decades of struggling and suffering to find a solution here? And, and that's really why, you know, it's so important to just try to get to that audience. And I, I'm actually looking for more younger people to bring on just to have some younger voices out there, you know, because everyone likes to hear someone they can relate to. And mm -hmm. having more young people speaking about this is a really, really powerful way to do that because they can they hear someone that they can recognize and understand. I, yeah, I think that's that's a that's a powerful strategy. Exactly. Like, and the young population is the future of any population of any country. Um, in Mexico, like I mentioned, seventy seven percent of the population of the infantile of the young population has obesity or or, or is uh, overweight, and that, that that's going to 
take down productivity enormously, enormously. So yeah, we, I agree with you. We need to find a way to bring carnivore down to the, to the younger population. The problem is that obviously they're perhaps a bit more rebellious. <laughs> they're, uh, they, they're feeling okay, but that's because they're young. You know, they haven't yet suffered the consequences. So I think that that is the challenge, but definitely sharing stories is the, the, the way to go. And perhaps maybe it's not influencing young people like one by one. It's like perhaps looking at who these young people look up to, you know, be it a football, like in Mexico, a football, uh, well, soccer, <laughs> soccer, football, soccer is a very uh, popular sport. Like if you can get like these people who they consider their, their gods or idols, right, to, to talk and get into carnivore diet, I think that's perhaps the best way to get the young population in. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, there has to be some way to do this. <laughs> you get some of those those lucha libre wrestlers yeah. to wear some like meat themed outfits or something. <laughs> that's that's I, when I was in Mexico City. I went to one of those events. It was hilarious. <laughs> I, I've always heard that was a big part of the culture in Mexico, but that's the first time I saw I've it. I've never gone to a uh, lucha libre. Play. That's also like a central Mexican thing, to be honest. In the yeah. north, you've never seen it. Really, well, maybe funny near the border. Uh, near the border, yeah, definitely. And. I, I was meaning to, meaning to ask, when you walk into a uh, supermarket over there in, in Oaxaca, again, I've never been to Oaxaca before, uh, out of, let's say, out of 10 Mexicans, how many of them are either overweight or, or obese? Oh, man. If, hi. If you're just including, like, bloated and inflamed looking, where you, which is sort of what I think is the most common look here, is not super morbidly obese, but definitely just, you know, a, a puffy appearance puffy you know and, yeah. and i think that when you ask an american person like what is the the typical like mexican physique you know they're gonna say well they're short and they're chubby you know and from my experience here that's pretty accurate unfortunately it's very accurate that's like what pretty much all people are in the country too it's it's not that you know the ones that we see in the U.S. are are only like that. They're they're like that everywhere here. And this is actually a good good point to bring up, perhaps, because you're you, you gave me a little bit of hope that the North is much more meat centric. So oh, the fact that I'm I'm sort of seeing the worst of it here in the South is, I guess, good you news are. to me. Um, but I I wonder what the the average stats are for height depending on region because th Oof. this is something that I know that I brought up on social media before. I believe you commented on it was. This is just this thing that we all believe is just normal that Mexican people are very short. But I think you may agree there's perhaps something bigger going on there, this generational shit diet that is not giving the people their nutrients that they need so they can't grow. Um, and I know Mexican people from more well-off places, Cancun, one of them. All my friends over there come from you know comfortable families where they eat lots of meat, and all of them are my height. They're around six foot. They're good. But down here in the southern side, everyone is – I'm towering over everybody here at 6'1". And uh, it, do you believe as well that there's a big uh, you know, diet factor in the fact that you know, certain parts of the population are really short? Oh, of course. And uh, again, it goes back to pre-Hispanic pre times. Uh, in the south, like they were corn. Everyone was shorter. Mayans are very short people in stature. And even back then, the people of the north, the Apaches, the Comanches and uh, – they were a lot taller than the Aztecs and the, the Mayans. Well, the Aztecs also came from, from the north, so they were actually taller than, than the Mayans. And I do believe that has to do a lot with nutrition, even since then and still now. Like still now in the south, they don't eat as much. Um, it's a lot of grains, what they eat, basically, and legumes. And I had a, a friend in Cancun, actually, and uh, he, he has he's a carnivore himself. He's been a carnivore for almost two years. And he has a Mayan friend who's also just basically a carnivore. And he towers above his uh, people, like the other Mayan looking people. So those who say it's genetics, like it's a lot of times it's nutritional. Like it depends he on what He probably didn't even start when he was really young, did he? Yeah, exactly. So, so if you started from birth, you know, like the car where parents now starting to feed their, their babies like eggs and little bits of ground beef instead of, you know, formula with seed oils in it, you know, that's going to exactly. have a huge impact. It's going to make it even more apparent. Yeah, and, and, and we've seen it many times. This is not something new. Like, I think uh, I, I I don't know when the studies were done. I don't remember exactly. Uh, I think it was Japanese population uh, compared, like I think in the mid and uh, mid twentieth century, comparing like American Japanese or American Chinese compared to some Asian population, 
and the height, like they're exact same, let's say lineage, even like family members, but they were overall taller in the USA than in these poor countries. And it was because of malnutrition, you know, like genetically, they're basically the same, but it's all about nutrition that, that, that caused this difference in, in height. So I think a lot of that is definitely due to nutritional deficiencies. Actually, malnourishment is still a thing in Mexico. Like uh, for children under the age of uh, five, I think one out of every five child is malnourished. Uh, and that's mostly in the southeastern part of Mexico, where you are actually in Oaxaca and Chiapas. Uh, those are actually the poorest states of uh, of Mexico. I'm pretty sure you've seen it around. Oh, yeah. Um, you've been to Mexico City, right? Yep. I, so I started in Mexico City. I was there for, I think, two weeks. And then I spent three weeks in Oaxaca. And I've been here in San Cristobal and Chiapas for about three weeks, I think. Three weeks. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. perfect. Yeah, so like you can see the huge contrast. Like Mexico City is huge metropolis, large buildings. It's it's almost like New York, you know, almost like the city that never sleeps. And uh, then you go to like Oaxaca on the southern part. It's just poverty everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Like, uh, have you have you been to the to the capital city? Sorry, of Oaxaca. Oh, um, I th I think that's just like Oaxaca City, right? The main city. I see. Huh? You've been to? Yeah, that's where I was. Mm, just, How was it just there? like? Um, you know, I mean, I would say going from Mexico City to Oaxaca to Chiapas has definitely been sort of just a step down each time in terms of just like cityness. <laughs> <laughs> it's there's no like skyscrapers or anything. It's all low buildings. Um, very beautiful. So much art. There, it's an amazing artsy just walking around, just looking at all the street art and the culture and the the outfits it, it's beautiful and i know that they're very well known for a really great dia de los muertos parade for anyone looking for a place to go oaxaca is supposedly Oof. one of the best they're they're in mexico city yeah. they're the two best yeah yeah and I, that's another thing that the north differs from like uh, our customs like we don't really celebrate day of the dead as much oh, really? Actually, I, Interesting. I, yeah we do obviously we do but nowhere near as intense as in like around the central part of mexico and southern part of mexico we're about we're a bit more americanized up here in the north again again more beef uh more of this uh, fast food type things and uh even halloween is celebrated up here and it's uh, quite oh quite really common. Huh. and in the south being more religious they see halloween as like the demons uh, the devil's celebration stuff like that so yeah i'm telling you like i'm thinking mexico should be divided into at least three different countries because of how different uh the the regions are it's has like, that ever been a conversation because i know in the oh, u.s we always have these pop up of like oh is texas ever going to secede or is the west coast is like, gonna secede? like these places that are really different from the place around them and this has become more and more common these discussions come up is that happening in mexico too of course yeah and they call it north exit north exit <laughs> brexit, brexit so it's basically the north breaking off from the rest of mexico because uh you know the elections were re re recently held in mexico actually the the, the new president shane baum was uh she came into office this month and uh, there's a, a huge like left and right divide in Mexico, but we all know it's a uniparty thing anyways. But um, the North is more, let's say, capitalistic thinking. Actually, the North is where all the productivity of Mexico is, well, most of it. Uh, they're act a lot of the states up here are actually autosufficient. They could sustain themselves with their own economy. But what happens in Mexico is that everyone, all the states send, well, the taxes they recollect, they send them to the federal government. And the federal government decides what each state gets. So it's the northern states that are subsidizing the southern states. So the money in Oaxaca is mostly coming in from the northern states of, of Mexico. Interesting. So nor North Exit is, a, it, it comes out, Mexicans love to meme and love to joke. So it starts out as a meme, but I'm seeing it become more and more common. Uh, I don't know who you, if you know who Ricardo Salinas is. Uh, um, that name sounds very familiar. I think billion, he's a billionaire that's friends yeah. with like Max Kaiser and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, Mexican billionaire. Also, I think he gets along with uh, Safe Edina Moose. Uh, he, uh, start, he brought that up a few months ago, North Exit. So like, you know, influential people like that so i think it gets the conversation definitely going and uh i i actually i would support something like that i would totally support separation and we, the north has a lot of potential like it's got a lot of the, the factories see a lot of industry we got a lot of beef we got farmlands in case of those who want to eat plants still but uh we got the ocean we got, we got the gulf of mexico on one side we got the pacific ocean on the other side so there's a lot of potential in this uh <laughs> separation but uh it's just uh interesting thought yeah, experiment. it's kind of like there's two two sides of the coin for me and i i haven't spent enough time really getting to know the culture to have 
a decision on whether I think that would be good or bad for the country as a whole. But the fact that, yeah. like you said, the North is doing much better in terms of, you know, meat availability, diet is doing better. Salaries are better. the South, which is really struggling. Part of me thinks like, man, it's kind of, when you look at the country, it's kind of like a, there's like a battle for where that line gets pushed in terms of diet. Like could the North, you know, win in the sense that it pushes that diet outward and more of the people south from the South would, you know, move toward that way of eating. Do you think that's possible at this point? Or is there too much division between the regions that that could happen? I th I'm telling you, like, this is like since pre-Hispanic times, there were like many, many, many native ethnic groups the Aztecs, the Mayans, the uh, Zapotecas, uh, like Los Tolmecas, like a lot of these different uh, societies. And they were at war with each other all the time. Like there's, a, like there's some pretty good division there. And I know everyone hated the Aztecs because the Mayans and Aztecs are not the same. A lot of people, for some reason, confuse them. So the Mayans are a whole different thing. Aztecs are another. Uh, Could you give actually, a quick overview of those two? Because that's such a big part of the history. And I don't even really know myself. I haven't yeah, researched that okay. very much. So the Mayans are basically in the southeastern part of Mexico, it's like from, from where you are, like uh, from Oaxaca all the way to Quintana Roo, that goes down to Belize and half of Central America. That's what the Mayans were. And uh, we talked about them. They, they, they think they were like the perfect form because of they're made from the blood of the gods and, and, and corn. The Aztecs, on the other hand, were mercenaries uh, initially, like before they established their, their capital city in uh, Tenochtitlan. They were mercenaries for the groups around there. They came from the north, according to their like history. They came from the north, and uh, they did they, they fought in wars. And then they realized that you know what, we could take over this land and stuff. And that's what exactly what they did. And the story goes that their gods told them to look for an eagle eating a snake on a cactus. And they found that exactly in the middle of a lake. So, <laughs> and that's what's on the flag now. For those that don't know, that's on the Mexican flag. Exactly. So that's where they that's where they started the empire, and they say that they started piling up dirt, like they started building, like put they built ground into the the lake and built their their giant beautiful city there. Which when Hernán Cortés arrived, says that what, the only cities that uh, rivaled it in Europe were like Rome, like these massive cities. I think it had like half a million people when uh, Hernán Cortés arrived, which is pretty big, pretty big uh, population back then and uh but the aztecs were were ruthless like ruthless like i guess savages they would eat humans as a normal part of their diet like the emperor moctezuma would have this uh, tra very traditional mexican dish called pozole i don't know if you had it or heard of it it's basically chicken with uh these grains these uh corn grains big ones and uh, during, uh, but in festivals, the Aztecs, instead of it being chicken meat, it was human meat from their prisoners. And they said that butt cheeks were the best part of the human. So, uh, <laughs> oh God. So uh, Aztecs wow. were kind of carnivores, but perhaps in the not, <laughs> not the kind way. we're going for. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So a very big difference. Um, the Mayans, the Aztecs came originally from the north. The Mayans were already there. You know, the... Uh, the Bering Strait, it's the Bering Strait, it has to be that. Uh, that, that, that they crossed in a few different waves when there was this ice bridge between Alaska and Russia. So the first wave went all the way to South America, and there were other two waves that followed. I think the Mayans were in the second wave. I'm guessing the Aztecs were in, around the last ones. But uh, yeah, so they're, they're, they're not the same people. They have a different language. The Aztecs speak Nahuatl, and uh, the Mayans always speak, speak Mayan. Even Mayan, though, has like... 30 different subtypes. Like there's Mayan populations that don't understand each other in that same region because you know, language has differed a bit. And, uh, but either way, the Aztecs had a huge uh, culture around corn. Like corn was one of their main foods all the time. And um, wait, what was I mentioning that again? Da, da, da. Oh man, I, I had to take us off in that direction. I <laughs> forgot what we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I think you mentioned something about uh, Changing people's eye oh yeah, of the north, bringing in their influence oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. down mm -hmm. to the south. Yeah. So that was just an overview of as to how ingrained the culture. Well, okay, Aztecs perhaps a bit carnivore there, right? But not the carnivore we want. Um, but it's really hard. Like, again, it's part of their identity uh, to eat grains and tortillas. Yeah. And my wife makes a lot of fun of Mexican cuisine because she said it's not so great at all. It's just you just fold the tortilla differently and it's called something different. Like, nothing. <laughs> no yeah. big deal. Enchiladas. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, we call them, gringas, montados, burritos, flautas. It's just a tortilla rolled up in a different fashion, perhaps maybe with deep fried or not, but it's the same crap. I would, ag uh, I would agree with her, to be honest, especially now that I know how bad for you all those things are. Like, I, I can't praise a diet that's just all carbs, which this is. Yeah, exactly what it is. Exactly what it is. And let's, let's be honest, it's, it's slave food uh, to eat all these type of grains. Like if meat was so bad, they would feed it to slaves back in ancient times. And no, it's grains, just enough for you to live. But, uh, you know, it's cheap to produce and you weren't feeling 100% all the time. So that's, that's a big problem. But again, wealth, I think, would be a big thing there. Because it is seen as, as you get wealthier, you do consume more meat. You do end up buying more meat. And Mexico's poverty, like the, the wealth gap is huge. It's huge. So I, that's where I do think Bitcoin can help a lot like right yeah like we we can't just we can bombard them with information yeah carnivore diet is the best like abandon all your plants but uh they're not gonna afford be able to afford much meat like you can go cheap but just so you know the average mexican earns 207 pesos a day which is like what five bucks six bucks yeah a day like 10 bucks or less yeah, and, and I don't know what the price is down there in the south for red meat, but it's a lot more expensive than in the north. Yeah, so it would be hard. For it's sure. it's be hard. not even that much different than the U.S., to be honest. Honestly, like, well, like when I look at my my card notifications after I go shopping, I'm just like, oh, my gosh, that's like that looks like an American price right there because yeah. it's really this super ultra premium luxury thing here. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, they could go pork. They could go chicken. That's definitely better than eating what they're eating right now. But uh, there's a lot to do, and I think that's where fixing the money helps uh, increase the possibility of a diet improving. Because no one's going to improve their diet if they're <laughs> dying of starvation. They, they have no money, you know. Like you're going to eat whatever crap you can give your family, and that's yeah. very popular here. Uh, Maruchan, like these instant uh, noodles in a cup. Oh yeah, like, you'll they're see everywhere. Them everywhere, Those, exactly. The instant noodles, mm -hmm. and that's very cheap. And uh, for example, also a very common thing in the north uh, amongst the natives here, los raramuri. Uh, they have something called pinole. So pinole is basically grounded corn, it's like this white powder, and they dilute it in water. And that's what they have as like an energy drink or a meal. If they're, <laughs> oh, no. if they're feeling fancy. Just corn paste. Corn paste. If they're feeling <laughs> fancy, they might add some sugar to it. Uh, and if they're especially wealthy one day, they can add milk instead of water, right? But... Uh, as you can see, like in Cancun, they have like that's one of the most popular snacks. It's probably around here too, but I just like zone it out because I know I'm not going to eat any of this stuff, so I don't even look for it anymore. <laughs> but in Cancun, I remember like a bunch of people in the house were like, "Oh, like we need to go to this this uh, this classic Mexican spot that has cups of corn and like cream or something." It's literally just like creamed corn cups. Really, and this is like this thing that they think is so good. I I, I think it was cream. It oh. was just a huge cup of corn with something else in it. Ah, yes, that's very popular in Mexico. It's like a a, a, a cup, literally just corn inside. You put cream, you put chile, you put some lemon, you add a crap load of other random sauces, and then they give it to you. That's very popular here in in the north as well. Basically, Again. the most indigestible thing you could possibly make. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it can cause some harm, especially if you're lactose intolerant, and obviously, no. Oh. For anyone, basically, it can cause problems. The Mexicans have a huge uh, tradition of eating a lot of chili, like a lot of spicy food. So, you know, the toxins and like, uh, I forgot the name of, uh, in Spanish, solanasias, like peppers and tomatoes come from this this plant. I forgot the name of it in English. I don't but know But it was either. highly toxic hundreds of years ago. Like it was a toxic plant that could kill you. And then with human you know, breeding and selection, they managed to kind of make it more edible. But uh, yeah, you know, some of the toxins are still there. They will irritate your gastric system. Like Mexicans suffer a lot from um, reflux, reflujo, and uh, you know, gastritis and all these type of things. It, it's the diet. And the worst thing is that every Mexican, you know, here in the pharmacies, you can buy a lot of medication without a doctor's uh, prescription. So a lot of people auto-medicate auto uh, and they buy this omeprazole and uh, anti-acids and things like that. That, yeah, per perhaps it reduces the intensity of the symptoms, the burning sensation in your throat, but um, it's going to only make the problem worse because you're not solving the problem, the, the root cause. You know, the, the, the problem is that you're destroying your, your, your digestive system because of all the plant toxins. And you're just making it a bit more bearable to uh, tolerate this reflux. 
But uh, that's it, uh, you talked about earlier, just this this mantra that we love so much that Dr. Chafee brought to the table of the plants are trying to kill you. And trying to kill you. <laughs> we, we eat these things that make our mouths explode with pain. <laughs> Obviously, this plant is trying to stop you from eating it. It's the, and, and like you said, the fact that we're able to eat it and not die is just a result of, you know, many, many hundreds to thousands of years of selective breeding that makes it just less toxic enough that it won't kill you, but it's still bad for you. And yeah. I think that there's so many people still confused about this back home. I think about like, is spice bad for you or is it, is it fine? And just the, the more you go down a carnivore rabbit hole, the more you just think about nature and like, why does nature do this thing? And it's so clear that it's, it's trying to stop you from eating it and it's poisoning you. So don't eat it. I mean. yeah exactly <laughs> basically black pepper has a lot of oxalates for example yeah like that's not, yeah exactly so uh or oh, yeah so plants are trying to kill us and in mexico it's been calculated that we need like two hundred fifty thousand more doctors and no two hundred thousand more doctors and two hundred fifty thousand more nurses to be able to uh take care of our sick population but i think you could really reduce all the, the need for so many uh healthcare professionals if you just <laughs> Tell people to start eating healthier, you know, like, uh, well, not told them, they just In simply real like, healthier, not that guidelines yeah, healthier. Real, exactly. Like, Meats. I don't know how influential those guidelines are. Like, I've never seen any patient like, say, oh, I follow, I'm following the guide, the Mexican guidelines, 2023 edition. Like, they don't look into that. Like, Mexicans don't get any uh, nutritional, if they want nutritional advice, they look for it themselves. Like, no one's looking. I don't know how, how it is in the, in the United States. Like, do you guys, do, you, do Amer average American look at the American guidelines for, for nutrition? So I'm glad you asked that because I, I think I asked the same question to Nina Teichel when I talked with her. And mm -hmm. she gave this answer that completely helps me understand the situation better. It's not so much that individuals are actually looking up these government guidelines, but it's that the schools and the hospitals and all of these like public places are they go straight to the guidelines they that is mandated they have to use the guidelines so the schools and the hospitals there are the two biggest ones and lots of other ones too but these really sensitive populations are getting subjected to this because of the guidelines because that's what the government says and they just do it they just pull their recommendations from the government i, I don't know if that's the same in mexico or not do you think it is Oh, in Mexico, at least, for, at least in my training, which is uh, <laughs> nutrition was like a second thought. We didn't even look at the guidelines. Like we, don't, we didn't, I don't think any of my colleagues knew what the guidelines were for nutrition, even though they're out of whack. Like no one knew uh, w which ones they, they, they were. I guess if you study nutriology, you become a, a dietitian or something here in Mexico, then yeah, perhaps you'll look into the guidelines. So even here, uh, most doctors don't know what the, the guidelines are. So I think it's just a lot of repeating of what they've heard in the past, you know, on TV, other doctors like grains, fruits, vegetables, good, red meat, bad. And they just repeat it without even knowing or analyzing the, the, the data. So like, I think that's the situation in Mexico, more or less. I could be wrong, but yeah, uh, yeah it leaves a lot to be, to be desired. And you've, you sort of like mentioned a couple of times about the things that you've experienced from your educational journey. And I'd love to hear more about that. Could you give us just a walkthrough of sort of how that started for you, how you learned throughout that process and when you started catching on it, there were some holes in it. Could you give us a walkthrough there? Sure. So uh, I think first, a uh, quick overview of how me uh, medical education is here in Mexico. I was in the public university. So it's one of those supposedly autonomous universities, but there's a lot of government funding in it, funding in it, and it's relatively affordable, but the infrastructure sucks. So I remember the first uh, three, four semesters of my uh, medical education, I was on the floor, you know, because there weren't enough uh, stools for people to <laughs> sit down and look at the class. Uh, so a lot, very, because th when I entered university, this gover gover new governor came in and said, you know, no one is going to be without education because back then you had to do like these uh, tests, these entry exams, and they would filter out and only a few select people would get into med school. Well, this guy said, no, nope, everyone who applies gets in. So that screwed everything up. That's why I was on the floor the first three, four semesters. Sounds so fiat to me. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Get more votes. Right. So, um, and, and, uh, initially La watch, which is where I come from, La Universidad Autónoma de Chihuahua, it was ranking pretty high, like I think in the seventh place na na nationwide and like uh, 
quality of education for, for and med school wise. And uh, it dropped a lot after this uh, implementation. So it was a lot, it was a lot very practice based initially, like you would actually go to the hospital and practice how it should be. And then with all these amount of, of, of students, you weren't going to go to the hospital with uh, a group of 40, 50 people. So it became more theory based, zero practice. So that sucked a lot. So then in Mexico, it's seven years to study med school, five years of theory. Then you have a year of in your, in, in your internship and a year of um, social service. That's where I learned the most. So I was there. I, I finally, I, I struggled a lot in the beginning because I had no practical uh, pr uh, knowledge, but uh, yeah, practicing and everything. But uh, I came out as your average fiat doctor, to be honest. So. My, my, my journey began when I came, I went to Latvia because we were, we, me, my wife and I wanted to go to, to Germany to our, do our residency there. And the plan, we had children. So she, the, and she, since she was an EU citizen, it was easier for her to get to, to Germany. So the plan was I take care of children. She turbo studies German and she gets there. Why is this important? Because it gave me kind of free time. You know, with med school, I did not want to pick up any books like uh, on in vacation time, I just wanted to chill, play video games, go out with my friends, didn't want to pick up any textbook. And I recovered my passion for learning. So it was being out of the fiat <laughs> uh, uh, education system where my interest in learning came back to me. And that's when I started getting down Austrian economics. And I started asking, I'm a curious person. My curiosity came back to me. So that's how I started discovering all these things. Like Safety in a Moose, and then he would talk about uh, carnivore on his podcast. And... Uh, and health problems that my wife had, these were all things that pushed me more and more towards carnivore. So if you want to hear more about that, there I have like a, I have a podcast with Dr. Sean Baker where I go more into details. But uh, we talked about my, that on our last episode too, sort yeah, of how you well. and her, how she was sort of the catalyst for both of you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got into it. But it was because I was no longer subjected to the constant stress of hospital work. Because I think the average doctor has no time to look into Austrian economics, Bitcoin, and things like that, when he has to worry about studying for a hundred different exams, preparing a thousand presentations. And uh, it was just a, a break from that that allowed this to, to, to happen. So yeah, I, I have no idea how other doctors could follow something similar, a, an awakening type of moment. I wonder how the percentage is, <laughs> if you compare the, like the percentage of American doctors figuring out to Mexican, because uh, trying to come up with a math here, you're like the, the only one we know <laughs> that, we, that we can find. So compared to the U.S., there's still not very many, but there's also more, you know, total people there going through it. It's probably similar, but it's freaking tiny everywhere, mm -hmm. which is a problem and also a motivator to to get out there and get more of the people that you know. There's, I mean, the vast majority of the people going through the system, at least the ones I know, are super well-intentioned people, the best intentions they want to help people. They want to do good in the world. Uh, they're just so beaten down by these corrupt, pharmaceutically funded systems, big food pharma. And this is what I talked about with uh, Matthew Leshak and Nina Teichel's both just how there's a mess of an incentive structure there where big food and big pharma and even the government have an incentive to keep people eating shit food. And the government one, which is like the one that a lot of people aren't really putting together is it's a lot easier to hide the inflation data, the real inflation, when people are eating industrial garbage that can be really scaled quickly and just churned out on an assembly line versus a cow, which takes work to feed. And oh, by the way, there's all kinds of, you know, conspiracy entries on this because there right now there's fires all over specifically the places where they have pasture in Wyoming and a lot of other states across the U S right now are literally on fire, very specifically suspiciously in these places where they're, they're ranching cattle. Um, it's scary. It's scary. <laughs> like there's, there's so much on each side. There's, you know, a lot to be scared about, but there's, you just have to use that energy and just put it toward pushing for the solution. That's what we have to do. It's what we all have to do. Actually, I think like during the COVID years, uh, I think there was a lot of news. It was showing up in the news a lot in the United States. Like a lot of the production, food processing facilities were burning down. Also, no, randomly, and it's always <laughs> and it's always like eggs or meat. Yeah, it's exactly. Never no the plan. Doritos factory that's going up in flames. <laughs> exactly, and in Mexico, like I, I, I agree. Like that is, 
you see the the guy the guidelines I showed you, like what's recommended to be on your plate. Like that is one hundred percent fiat food. That, that is cheap, easy to produce foods that uh, the average Mexican perhaps won't notice in their well. And for example, I, I checked inflation like a few months ago, like six months ago. I, I buy uh, mineral water or sparkling water, and uh, the price went up seventeen percent in just around six eight wow. months. That's sparkling water, and it's like, wow. There's no way. Like, what's the price for everything else? Because I haven't I haven't checked. I get my meat from a meat distributor type of guy like prices are actually kind of more stable there for some reason I, that's his business but uh since i don't shop around anymore with other uh other products i can't imagine how the inflation is is there for the for the average mexican because salaries are definitely not going up 17 percent year over year and uh i i really i do wonder what will happen to uh because you can control the population as long as they're well fed and entertained and the moment that they can no longer find uh, feed themselves, like I think that's when shit really hits the fan. And uh, I don't know. I just really hope it doesn't get to that. I really hope it doesn't. If I recall correctly, I think the stat historically is as soon as food costs take forty percent of someone's income, that's when you just see a skyrocketing in the prevalence of riots and major social unrest. I think I learned that from a Mike Maloney Goldbug video because they're talking about how closely intertwined the 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 money in the society is which is something that so few people understand like we always talk about that hardly anyone understands the the bitcoin side of this you know we're talking about how early you know mexico is to carnivore they're super super early to bitcoin too i don't even know which one's like considered earlier it's super early for both of them and now we don't even talk about <laughs> nostr that's like a, a Oof. Yeah, no. How many total messages are on Nostra? I don't want to know. It's, we have so much work to do. Like, there's so much to do, which is exciting. But, you know, man. Th th that's why I think, like, I I've been hearing a lot of uh, regenerative ranching type uh, uh, podcasts. Alejandro Carrillo, he's a rancher who lives in the same municipality that I do. He's a regenerative rancher. He gives does talks. Does he speak and... English? Yeah, he does. He I does. want him. He, I yeah, need more sure. of these people. I just sure, had Joel I'll... Salatin a couple of weeks ago, which was like awesome. I want more yeah, yeah. more people like that. I'll send you his contact. I have his contact. And uh, he was in Mongolia not long ago. He goes to China, Mongolia, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and he gives uh, talks, teaches people how to do regenerative farming and the benefits of it. So he's a big guy, I, in my opinion. And um, and I, he, he mentioned something. Well, he, he showed up in Dr. Sean Baker's podcast too. And he says that you focus more on the your good land first. Like when you start regenerative farming, you don't focus on the barren land that's all destroyed. You focus on your richest land first. You make that grow, and then it just starts spreading out from there on. You know, so I I thought about that. I'm like, okay, we should start on the most fertile ground, and at least in Mexico, I think the north is it. Like, meat is already part of our culture. Like that, even since pre-Hispanic times. So that's one thing. We're wealthier, in the Mexican terms. So I think. They're more willing to accept Bitcoin, you know, because if uh, you're you're living day, paycheck by paycheck, you're not going to look into Bitcoin. So I, I I I don't know. I have this dream, this vision of like starting something. I, I want to make carnivore conventions in northern Mexico. I want to talk about Bitcoin in northern Mexico because I really do think that it is the fertile ground to spread these type of ideas. I mean, North Exit. No one talks about South Exit or Centro Exit. It's it's North Exit. So these people are in the right mindset, you know. Like I think. We got this uh, community, this uh, movement going, but it just needs like this, this uh, spark to, to, to ignite it. But uh, maybe I'm just being uh, delusional, but uh, that's, that's kind of what I want to do. It's my mission in the next, hopefully 10, 20 years. I love it, man. And I can't think of a more important mission than that. Truly. It's uh, the world needs it right now, especially in a place like Mexico, which has so much awesome history and culture but it's it's just buried under that layer of fiat right now that we're seeing. And yeah. I'm super glad that we got to talk about it today. I I just saw our little tiny house chihuahua run by. I kind of want to see if I can grab her and have her come over and ask you the final question. Let me see if I can go get her. She sure. just ran by me. Give me just a sec. <laughs> yeah, no problem. All right. We have a Mia. Mia, what's your last question for Dr. Morales? <laughs> she says, could you give a message 
to all the young doctors out there, of which there are so many, who want to help the world and are just not sure how to, and are maybe a little bit scared of looking into this this dark hole realization that everything they were told is a lie and they need to do potentially make some enemies to get on the side of the correct right now. That's a, good, that's a very loaded question. So, um, honestly, I would say, start with yourself. You have to work on yourself first. Like don't work outwards if you're not in a position to do so. So first you gotta start questioning yourself. Uh, if you're in the medical field, for example, question like is, where is all the the information all the all the knowledge that where, where's it where's it sourced from and you'll find out that it's most likely from you know like the sugar industry the pharmaceutical industry and stuff like that and then question okay who's out there saying different things and then hear different things you know hear the vegans out hear the carnivores out like honestly explore your options like don't be closed minded especially in, in the beginning you can later close down like for example you're you're a carnivore you're convinced i don't think anyone will ever convince you to be vegan right but uh yeah and initially yeah, have an open mind totally and not just and not just don't focus on one thing cuz uh i think it's a problem with specialities nowadays like you focus on just one thing you're the you're best in one thing but you you close your mind to everything that's around you learn about what is money because that that is the base of society in a way, it's technology that helps uh, move value forward. It helps you it helps with peaceful exchange. Basically, it's 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 a remedy for violence for uh, going devolving into a more primitive state. So learn what is money, learn what true health is, and like uh, quick tip, it's it's food. <laughs> like food is the base of health. Like amongst other things, like sunbathing and grounding and things like that. But food is definitely one of the most important. Once you have that out, uh, seek a community. Because going out alone is hard. And that's what I kind of did in the beginning. I felt so alone initially. Uh, no one else talking about this. I felt like I'm, I'm the only Bitcoiner in the city, I think. I don't know. But you have internet now. And you can reach out. You can form your own communities. Like I'm doing right now. I'm making a podcast. I'm getting to know a lot of amazing people I never thought I'd get to know around the world. And you don't feel alone. When you start making these communities, when you have a, a, a more a bigger understanding of how the world works, then I think you can take on the challenges of the world because they will try to strike you down. They will dissuade you and they might make you feel miserable. And it may, may even make you, make you question yourself whether what you're doing is right or, or wrong. But uh, if you have these pillars already in place, I think you can get through it. And I think it's worth it. I, re I really think it's worth it because I, I can't imagine myself knowing what I know now and still giving the basic recommendations of like, you know, here's your insulin, here's your statins. And I couldn't live with myself. And I do think that a lot of the average, the average doctor honestly does want to help. The average health practitioner wants to help. So um, it's up to you to do it. And uh, you're not alone. Yeah. Reach out to either Ben, to me, you know, like uh, we have our social media, like we're very friendly. Uh, I don't know most how that will be right. Yeah, most Unless of the time, you tell yeah. me that fruit and vegetables are good for you. <laughs> exactly <laughs> but jokes aside like honestly uh i'm very open uh luckily we're, we're we're relatively small still right so we have a lot of time still to to respond to the small people or the medium people or whatnot because when people get big you know i've, I've tried messaging i can't get a, a a a hand on dr sean baker for example personally even if i want it impossible right even so, though you're uh, on his show right you know, yeah exactly <laughs> he's not someone to guess you can't even keep track of all those yeah i asked uh, not long ago with one of the the person who uh who booked me she said that uh, he's super booked since he went on joe rogan so anyways yeah we can reach out to us we're more than willing to help uh we're learning i'm still learning i don't know everything but uh, I've made it my mission to to continue learning every single day. And that's what you should do too. So I hope that that helps. <laughs> Absolutely. I love it. I think that's such a great story. Just once you see the light, you can never go back and you have to just dedicate a huge part of your time and energy to working toward a solution to this problem. And it's a good feeling. And I know it can be painful in the short term to make those changes you need to. You know, you're likely going to, it, the very least strain or even lose friendships over this sometimes because you are completely going against what all those people like for you in, in the, the medical system, the people that you went to school with, all the, the connections you made, the friends you made, you're basically going against what they've learned. So now they're, you know, sort of pushed in a way that could be, you know, there's, there's some disagreement there. There's some uh, conflict sometimes perhaps. So, but once you, you completely dedicate yourself to the truth. You will find your people 
and you will not be so alone anymore. And you're still pretty alone in Mexico. I'm not going to lie. We're going to fix that. <laughs> Even, <Please. laughs> you, you have to look internationally for your help most of the time because it's so rare. And that's yeah. why I'm so happy to, you know, just keep boosting you as much as I can, because I know there are so many, you know, people out there with Mexico connections. It's, it's so common in the U S so the American yeah. listeners will probably know people um, that have at least have family there that they can sort of pass the message down and just start that long process of normalizing this and bring it into the public consciousness so they can find people like you. And I can't think of any way to be in a better spot than you are right now, having a YouTube channel in Spanish ready to welcome everyone with open arms. And uh, yeah, everyone out there listening, if you know people that speak Spanish as their first language, make sure you go find your channel. And what are all the places people can go follow you, Dr. Fernando? I would really love it. Okay, if, you're, you, if you speak Spanish or you have family members who only speak Spanish, uh, my, on YouTube, uh, you can find me as at Fernando Morales MD. And there you can find the links to all my other social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I'm not really active there. I just mainly repost my, my videos from YouTube. If you want to catch me, like uh, if you want to you chat with me directly, where I am most active is on Noster. So if you don't know what that is, Ben actually has a fantastic episode on, on what Noster is with, um, with Derek Ross. We got more coming, recommend- baby. I got Will, Will Kasserin going up soon. We got Rival. We got lots of Nostra episodes. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Check that guy. Check that those things out, people, because why, why is that important? Because I could be canceled. Any other, other influ- uh, influencer can be canceled who speaks about the carnivore diet in the future. Who knows? And Nostra will most likely be the place to find them. You can't be censored there. So uh, I hope you can put my end pub there on the description because I, I don't sure. know how to mm-hmm. share the profile. <laughs> I want you to read off the whole thing right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it in the description for sure. So people can find you there. And uh, yeah, man, super glad we got to do this. I, I love that we, we brought back for round two for the first time ever. And it was a fantastic conversation. One that I needed to get off my chest. I, I needed to talk about this country more because I'm just seeing these things and it makes me really, you know, empathize with you because you're seeing this all the time and you don't have that many people to bounce these ideas off of so i'll always be there for you if you need to rant about mexico hit me up hopefully Thank soon you. we'll have some other you know mexican doctors out there that you can you know start I, I mean once you have just a handful you know things will just start taking off i feel like because something i've noticed here is that mexican people the ones that i've talked to in my experience here, like I've met quite a few like Mexican local people. They're doing this sort of same travel journey. And a lot of them are from Mexico City, so they speak English because I'm an idiot, can't speak Spanish. Um, <laughs> and so they they are extremely open minded to this compared to other countries, which I is very uh, it's a very good sign. Because yeah. when I talk to European people or people from Canada or USA, uh, I, I, I want to say Europe's even the worst. I feel like when I talk to Europe, I just get the most confidently wrong people I've, I've ever met. And it's just, it just, it's so uh, tough to get through to them. But when I, when I talked to Mexican people, there was even a night. I, I, I'll tell you a short story here. Yeah. In when I was in Oaxaca, so I can't keep my damn mouth shut. You know this probably. So I'm <laughs> always talking about this with everyone I meet everywhere. <laughs> I, I don't have a filter. And the people that have traveled with me in the past have, you know, eventually been like, Ben, come on, you can't talk about car with everybody. You can't do it. They're not going to learn that fast. But there was this night where I was with this group of European people. It was a mix of a bunch of Europeans. I think there was like Italy, Netherlands, uh, England, uh, French, like just a mix of a bunch of European folks that sort of met each other and were going around. And we all went on this cool walking tour of the city together. So we sort of became friends and we were going to go out to dinner. And somewhere along the line, they wanted to go to some, you know, plant vegan place and i was like oh, i'm actually like i only eat meat and so i couldn't do that and so and this just developed into a conversation where of course i'm going to like try to preach here you know because I, <laughs> I, these people are all leaving the next that. day so i might as well plant the seed at the very least um and it was just completely shut down reaction all negative oh. They oh, were just yeah. saying like, oh, like that's terrible for you and just giving you the concern trolling like, oh, you really need to go check your blood, blood tests and you need to do this because, you know, it's so bad. And they like one against you? six. Did they attack you? Did yeah, they attack they, so, you? So I brought or, it up. I instigated this. I instigated oh, okay. this. I instigated the conversation because I can't shut my trap. And they eventually all just like turn against me, essentially. <laughs> and so, uh, but, and, and but, a couple of the girls were vegan. So they were starting to get oh. like really, you know, emotional about it. And I was like, yeah. fuck. 
Uh, well, so uh, after that, I literally just like I left that group because they're all leaving the next day anyway. So I walked downstairs, <laughs> downstairs at this ping pong table at the hostel I was staying at. There are these two uh, girls from Mexico City were playing ping pong. And I just joined them and started playing and, you know, started talking to them. And we became friends. I got both of them on Noster. And wow. they're both interested in learning more about the carnivore diet. And so to me, like, I needed that so badly in that moment. Like, after just getting shut down by these westernized people, like, seeing that Mexican people are open to this is, that was, like, the white pill I needed. Like, this country has hope, you know. You Jehovah just have to Witness find type people. Of <laughs> that are they're open to that stuff and these are like city people so sort of uh similar to like city people in the u.s in yeah. like how they were brought up but if you talk to someone from a u.s city like seattle that meets good for you they just think you're crazy so some there's something here in mexico where uh people just have like a more open-mindedness about them i think um i'm not sure if you'd agree with that yeah. but that's been my short experience yeah the way i see it is uh well, first of all, uh, there's this type of I, I hear, I hear my, amongst my family and friends and stuff like that. There's a in Spanish called it's a classista. So basically, white people are perhaps more beautiful or smarter than the darker skinned people. That's kind of a common theme here in, in Mexico. So uh, if like this like smart European or in this case, American guy comes down and talks to you about these things. Like he probably knows what he's talking about. Like, especially if you look good, you know, I guess if you were like obese and things, you would look differently. So I think that, that, that might play a role. I could be completely wrong. Right. But I do see that. Like, for example, the typical comment that, Oh, like Germany is a, is a first world country. They're so much better than the average Mexicans. Cause a common saying in Mexico and other Mexicans can correct me if I'm wrong. And I don't think I'm wrong. There's a common saying said that, um, the only the only worst the, the worst enemy of a Mexican is another Mexican, or that Mexico is so so blessed, but it's full of Mexicans. So like, there's a lot of like racism towards uh, <laughs> towards ourselves. So I I don't know if that could play a bit. Other part is I do think that the Western like Europe especially is more uh, brainwashed with their the government has so much more control. Like if the Mexican knew how much yeah. how socialist. Germany was. I think there's more opportunity in Mexico, at least for businesses, than in in, in Germany and in, in certain aspects. It's illegal to even homeschool there. I learned yeah, recently. Exactly. So it's illegal. like it's it's actually crazy. I, there's a lot of these crazy government overreaches I didn't know about going on all over the place there, and it's terrifying because that's just going to ossify in this false confidence on bullshit even more. So definitely. That's and, terrifying. Uh, Maybe I'll have to go travel there in the next couple of years and get that feel for that <laughs> and see if there's any way that we can turn that around. That's maybe even more of a challenge. Yeah, it could be. And, uh, and, and real quick, just uh, in, in Mexico, again, there's a lot of poor people who are just trying to get by. They're not necessarily always listening to government propaganda. You know, they kind of follow what their grandparents did and their great grandparents did, which was like take teas, maybe not even take so much medication. And this is usually in, like, in the villages around. And they would cook with lard, you know, the way they're sure they're beans and they're maize, but they weren't eating a lot of processed food and things like that. So like this vegan, fantastic for the environment, the car work terrible for the environment. A lot of Mexicans don't really know that. Like the actual majority of the Mexicans who are poor do not know these or have these ideas. So I think it's, that's why it's perhaps easier to, to tell them, you know, what? carnivore is fantastic. Perhaps. Yeah. And, and like you've also said, there is some meat in the culture already that, you know, especially if you're further north, that's, it, it's easier yeah. to, it, it's very different depending on where you are, I guess. I haven't gotten enough of a sample size to really say that these, these two girls are from Mexico City. So that's <laughs> sort of the only real example I can think of. But once I learn Spanish, I'll be able to give you more data and I can actually talk to these people and <laughs> start <laughs> gathering. I hope better. you do. Yeah. Yes, man. I, de I definitely will. Hey, man, really appreciate you coming by. I, it's been excellent round two. Glad to chat. And uh, I look forward to continuing to watch you grow, can keep putting out more content. You're killing it. And uh, just sending more people your way to try to get you on their channel. We need to get you on Dr. Chafee. We need to get you on Dr. Barry. <laughs> uh, you're going to chat with Bart K soon. That's awesome. And uh, we're going to save Mexico, man. We're, Mexico is amazing. It's a beautiful country. And we're going we're gonna to get it fixed. I got to have you on as well on the podcast, Ben. We'll and, do it. Uh, Let's do it soon. Yeah, perfect. I'm down yeah. for sure. We'll, we'll figure yeah. it out soon. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank see you, you very later, much, man. Ben. Take Bye. care.